West Cumbria, an area whose fortunes have fluctuated just like the ebb and flow of the tide. Over a century ago, this landscape was so different. Tall sailing ships filled the harbours, and the names of the ports were known all over the world. The land was pockmarked with coal and iron ore mines. Thousands of men and their families depended on the rich seams for their livelihood. It was a time of thriving industry and progress, but it was also a time of great contrast between the rich and the poor. While merchants and mine owners lived in opulent Georgian houses, many of their workers existed in poverty that is barely imaginable today. Badly built homes eventually became some of the worst slums in the country. Running water and an efficient sewerage system that would be taken for granted today was non-existent. Disease and premature death was rife. For hundreds of years, the sea and the rich deposits of coal and ore beneath the earth dictated the fortunes of West Cumbria. In fact, the towns were just fishing hamlets at one time. The coastal fringe was a remote part of England. But three families dominate the development of the main towns. The Lowthers quickly realised the potential of the coal fields around Whitehaven, Workington. The Kerwins had long been the lords of the manor, descended from the kings of the English and the Scots. It was the resourceful Sir Henry Kerwin who exploited the coal on his lands. Further up the coast, it was the Senhouses. In those days, they were the most important family in a place called Ellen Foot. Humphrey Senhouse improved and enlarged the harbour in the 1750s. His wife was called Mary, the eldest daughter of Sir George Fleming, the Bishop of Carlisle. Humphrey wanted to name the port after his wife, who had borne him ten children. And so, Maryport came into being. 2,000 ships were built along the coast over the course of 200 years. The biggest builders were at Whitehaven, where a thousand vessels were launched. Major shipbuilding yards also developed at Maryport, Workington and Harrington. Over the years, the four ports launched a steady stream of ships from cutters and schooners to full riggers, and later iron tramp steamers and steel ships. Many of the builders were family concerns. They came and went. But some are an important part of maritime history. In Whitehaven, the most important was Daniel Brocklebank. He founded a shipbuilding dynasty, and his descendants went on to start the oldest registered shipping line in the world. It was later taken over by Cunard, which operates luxury liners like the QE2. At Maryport, there were the Ritzons. The family home still stands today in the town. For the size of the area, the Ritzons built large ships, some of them over 2,000 tons. They had a yard in Irish Street and had to launch their vessels broadside in the River Ellen. Even today, at low tide, you can still see where this happened. Perhaps the best known builders of all were the Ismays. Thomas Henry Ismay was born in 1837, the same year that Victoria became queen. He lived in Maryport, where his grandfather owned a shipbuilding yard. They were a well-off family, but after serving his apprenticeship, Thomas eventually became the owner of the Australian White Star Line. Their ships, like the Oceanic and the Teutonic, were among the best fitted and lavish of their day. But the line will forever be remembered for one of the greatest tragedies in the history of the sea. The Titanic, the supposedly unsinkable ship which struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage in 1912 and went down with the loss of hundreds of lives. Even though Ismay moved away from the area, he never forgot Maryport. In St. Mary's Church, there are stained glass windows which he donated in memory of his parents, Joseph and Mary, and his eldest daughter. At Christ Church, Ismay donated a clock in 1878. The house where he was born has long been demolished, and the Middleton shipyard, which was owned by his grandfather, is now just a grass area. But Ropery House in Ellenborough Place, where the Ismay family moved in 1843 and lived for many years, is another reminder of one of the giants of the shipbuilding industry. In his heyday, Thomas Henry Ismay was responsible for one of the most exclusive shipping lines in the world. Um, very opulent, very rich, 
beautiful, uh, luxurious uh, ships, yeah. Nothing like the ships that you would originally see working from Maryport, obviously. The days of shipbuilding along the coast have long gone. But at its height, Harrington and Workington had two shipyards each. Maryport had three, and Whitehaven had six. The ships brought prosperity and a link to the rest of the world. At one stage, Whitehaven was the second biggest tobacco importing centre in Britain. Tobacco from Virginia and Maryland during the 18th century was hugely profitable. It stood in large warehouses before being sent to France, Holland, Ireland and elsewhere. There was an abundance of different cargoes and more than 200 ships operated from Whitehaven. It became one of the leading ports in northwest England. An intriguing aspect of its seagoing history was the transportation of slaves from Africa to America on ships chartered in Whitehaven at a time when human beings were regarded as cargoes like tobacco and sugar. I think I'd like to be transported back to the day when, when all the harbours on the west coast were really busy. It would be incredible to see them. Basically, I would imagine lots of smoke, noise, and the, all the different smells of all the fish being landed and the smells of coal and smoke. But I think the most incredible thing would have been able to walk, as many old people have said you could do, from one deck to another of the ship. You could literally walk across and keep your feet dry, which um, when you look at it now, it's still busy, but I think it would have been incredible to have been able to do that.